welcome back to my channel or this is the first video that you're seeing then welcome to my channel and as you can tell from the title of this video i am filming the moral instrument city of heavenly fire book review i'm so excited it's the final book review you guys i'm so proud of myself like over the last two and a half months i've just been engrossed in this world and just reading these books whenever i got the chance and I don't know the exact pay amount of pages that I read, but I'm pretty sure it's well over 3,000. So the fact that I've read that many pages in what I think is a short amount of time, I'm just like, <laughs> yay me. But, but yeah, anyway, yeah, I really enjoyed this book. And it was a lot longer than the other ones, which makes sense because it's the, not just another book. It's the final book. So they're pretty much just wrapping everything up. And I like, you know, there's stuff that happened in the first book that you might have had questions about. But they brought that back up and they wrapped it up as well. So I thought overall it was a really great way to wrap up the entire story. I love the book. I love how the characters ended their stories. And oh, there's so much to talk about, you guys. So what am I doing? Enough rambling. Enough of this intro. Let's just go ahead and get into it. So one thing that I really liked and I also was not expecting was the fact that there was a lot of characters from other Shadowhunter Chronicles books that was mentioned in this story. So we got to meet the entire Blackthorn family as well as, you know, um, Brother Zachariah, Jim, and then Tessa and Will was mentioned. There's a, like a bunch of characters who... Um, are in future books as well and I know like obviously when the book came out the other stories hadn't been written yet so like it was they, there was a lot of mystery about the characters like you can tell that it was the beginning of another story so I like the fact that these characters were introduced in these book in this book particular so we're already pretty interested in them so I can't wait to start reading the next um shadow hunter book series i don't know when that's going to be we're going to talk about that towards the end but i just wanted to jump in here and say i really love that we've got like a little preview of what's to come in future books i love the fact that you know i think i like i feel like it was a great business plan by the author you know get us interested in what's to come and i certainly am and i'm definitely interested in reading the future book so i love that she did that So pretty much this entire book was fo focused around Sebastian's ultimate plan coming to fruition and there's a lot of terror and murder and massacre. He's just the ultimate evil in this story and I loved it. I loved my only complaint is that I wish we would have gotten a bigger look into like the attacks on the other institutes like I would have loved to see how the um. Buenos Aires Institute attack went down and exactly what happened at the London Institute why that one didn't work out the way he planned I really would have loved to be able to get a greater background look into you know just a more in-depth look into how that happened and what took place during those attacks it also would have been a really interesting way to um see the shadow hunters that became part of the Endarkin I would have loved to see more of who they were before they returned because there's a lot of sentimental value in that was, you know, having to kill someone you love. I would have loved to be able to um, <clears throat> learn more about the relationship that the Endarkin had with the Shadow World before they returned. I think that would have brought the sympathy factor up that much high, which maybe isn't a good thing because I was already pretty much crying throughout the entire book, but I would have loved to see more of that. But that's my only complaint with that. But since we're talking about the Endarkin, I do want to go ahead and mention the fact that I love, love, love how it was very descriptive about the sadness and the pain of having someone that you love being destroyed. Um, I really love the, my favorite, one of my favorite scenes in this book was um, Sebastian's attack on the Citadel. And there's this scene where one of the, one of the Endarkin and someone that they love, there was like this battle between them. And the person is just on their knees crying, begging him to remember them. And they end up killing them anyway. That was a really sad and depressing scene, but also I thought it was really... It was really beautiful how it was well described, the emotions between, you know, the the process of realizing that the person that you once knew has just been completely destroyed and taken over by this evil entity. It I liked I liked that that was very descriptive and it wasn't just oh like this is someone who I used to love, they're in dark and now it's sad we have to kill them. I like the fact that we went into details about, you know, what it was truly like to experience something like that and what it meant to 
the shadow hunters too ultimately have to come to the decision that they have to kill someone that they love and care about. I want to talk about the Sealy Queens because, like, this book was filled with stuff that I didn't expect to happen. And the alliance with the Sealies was pretty much one of them because in I feel like in the TV show, like, the Sealies, they weren't exactly good, but they weren't as evil as they described in this book particularly. And I wasn't expecting them to be on Sebastian's team. I wasn't expecting them to side with him. But I do like the fact that we, you know, there's a better explanation about what the Sealies are in this book because I felt like for, throughout the first five books, there was a big like oh well for me personally i feel like there was a bit of mystery about you know what exactly are these creatures like they can't lie but they're very deceptive and so they kind of just but they kind of just leave it at that so like we didn't really get to see anything about what it's like in the ceiling realm and like what it means what you are and stuff like that and i like the fact that in this book they explain a lot about the hierarchy and the role that the Sealy Queens plays and, you know, her relation with Sebastian, which kind of weird, but okay. But what it means to be a Sealy and, you know, what obviously with everything that happened with Mark becoming a part of the Wild Hunt and everything and how that's completely separate than the Sealy Court and how that's not really associated with that. It was just really great to learn more about the Sealies and about their history and how they, the role that they play in the Shadow World. I love the fact that we got a great in depth into that i want to go ahead and talk about jordan and maya's relationship in this book because it was it was like there was a bit of understanding and obviously sadness with him being killed and everything there was just a lot of emotions coming from me with this relationship in particular and maya as you know just her journey so like i said earlier there was a lot of things in this book that i was not expecting to happen Sebastian murdering Jordan was pretty much at the top of that list. I did not see that coming at all and the fact that it was so quick and swift. Not only did it give you an inside look about how truly evil Sebastian is, I um it was really beautiful how, you know, Jordan's last memory was his relationship with Maya and how, you know, they got back together and they're on great terms and everything. I thought that was really beautiful. But I was also initially surprised after that to hear how Maya was going to actually break up with Jordan and about how she didn't really see the connection. I was really surprised by that in the beginning but after she explained it it did start to make a little bit more sense to me. So pretty much Maya explained that her the reason behind her forgiving Jordan and wanting to get back together with him it was sort of a part of her wanting to go back to her past in that place of where she felt like the most normal. With everything that, you know, the relationship she had with her abusive brother and obviously the horrific way in which she became a werewolf, pretty much, you know, her relationship with Jordan and the love that they had, that was probably the only time in her life where she actually felt normal. And so that was why she wanted to, you know, forgive him and give the relationship another chance. Obviously, she eventually just realized that things change and they change for reasons and that although as much as we might want to we can't go back to the way things used to be and we have to accept things as they are now this was a message that really resonated to me resonated with me because of things that i things that i've experienced in my own past i'm not going to go into details about those but you know i've been through things in life and there are, you know, I feel like for everybody, there are moments where you just want to, you know, turn back the clock and go back to a happier time, especially when you're dealing with someone that's something that's so emotional at the time. But I like how Maya, you know, she she's come to accept what she is now and being a werewolf and accept it part of, you know, that things happen for a reason and she's in this place because that's what she's meant to be and that she can't force herself to feel the same way she did about Jordan because... Despite the fact that everything that happened, you know, was complete misunderstanding and it's not, it didn't happen the way she initially thought it happened, but it did happen and that led to a chain of events of her becoming a werewolf and it led to the life that she has now and sort of like forgiving Jordan and being with him, that's sort of like trying to rewind the clock, but she's realized that she can't do that because that's basically like saying she regrets being a werewolf or anything and she's finally at a point where she's accepted who she is and i like the fact that self-acceptance was a huge part of 
the Moral Instruments book series and all of these characters, you know, they're going through something in particular and it's not just like, obviously there's those supernatural elements of like, you know, the vampires and the werewolves and the shadow hunters and the sealies and stuff. There's a bunch of supernatural aspects in this story as a whole, but there's also a lot of humanistic traits and self-acceptance is definitely one of them. And so I feel like, you know, Maya's journey of self-discovery and the relationship that she has with Jordan is really powerful and there's a great message in that and I love reading about that. Also, separately from Jordan, Maya's, you know, um, her journey in herself, you know, obviously she's the leader of the wolf pack now and she's done a lot of things to help the pack get to where they are and that has a lot to do with what happened to Jordan and her wanting to get revenge for him and wanting to help defeat Sebastian. It starts out that way, but ultimately, you know, she obviously ends up coming into her own and with her being, you know, the leader of the werewolf pack, she's trying to change things for the better and get vampires and werewolves on better terms with each other. And, you know, I, that's one thing that I, you know, I don't know if we're going to be reading a lot about that in future Shadowhunters books, but I would love to see, um, get a chance to see some of the changes that Maya's making with the wolf pack because I feel like changes are on their way in this. She's working to help, you know, get rid of some of the prejudice between vampires and werewolves. And obviously there's messages in that that relate to everything that's happening in the real world right now. So that's all fine and good, but I would love to see more about how things change as she becomes a leader and how she changes things in the shadow world for the better between downworlders. So let's go ahead and talk about Simon and how his story ultimately ended up coming to an end in this book. So I feel like so far in the story there's been a bunch of up and down about Simon, you know, having trouble accepting himself accepting that he's a shadow hunter and accepting what he is but i like how in this book we really get to see him be a part of the team and he's working with you know clary and izzy and jace and alec and he goes to eden with them and he's like attacking demons left and right i feel like that's really a beautiful moment of like him finally like embracing his vampire nature and accepting what he is to a point obviously because you know we're gonna talk about that in a bit but overall it was really incredible to me to witness you know simon just helping everybody out and using his vampire abilities for that and like there wasn't a lot of talk in this story about in this book particularly there wasn't a lot of talk with simon about oh you know i hate being a vampire and i wish i was dead and i'm just a horrible creature and one of the most beautiful things to me was the fact that he can finally say the word god now because before he was turned into a vampire he was obviously very religious he was jewish and so not being able to say that that took like a great toll on him and i think that had a lot to do with why he was so depressed about being a vampire and everything that happened to him but now that he's at a point where he can say god i think that also that shows a lot about how he has, you know, accepted for himself for what he is and he's okay with being a vampire now he's not exactly thrilled about it but he's kind of just at a point where it's like it is what it is and you know this is who i am and i have to embrace that and he's using that to help the shadow hunters and he's a really great, great part of you know team good in this book so i like seeing that as well while we're on the subject of simon let's go ahead and talk about simon and isabel's relationship so Honestly, reading about them in this book, it did sort of make me even more angry at the TV show and the fact that it did get cut off so early because I would have loved to see how they brought such this beautiful relationship to life um, on television as it is in the book because their story really is beautiful. And I, I don't know, I just feel like, you know, with Isabel, she's always had to be like this warrior you know she's obviously a party girl and she likes to hang out and stuff like that but with her being a shadow hunter she's always kind of like put her emotions down and not really shown a lot of her sensitive side but after the death of max she's been forced to become a lot more vulnerable lately in her emotions she's not really hiding them a lot and because of that, you know, she's forced to confront the feelings that she has for Simon. And he, in turn, does that as well. And it's really beautiful, you know. 
I like, you know, first of all, the scene where Simon gets drunk on blood and he serenades Isabel and Alicante. I absolutely love that. And another favorite scene of mine was, you know, obviously once Simon first arrives in Alicante, the first thing Isabel does is she just runs into his arms and they just have this beautiful moment. When I first started reading his books, I wasn't really sure about Isabel and Simon's relationship. I wasn't against it. I just feel like it took us so long to get to the point where we're like, talking openly about the relationship that they have together. In this book, they reference, you know, always had, like, she'd be like, oh, I always thought he was cute. Like, they talk about moments like that, how in the past they kind of noticed each other but never did anything about it. Well, I feel like in the first three books, we didn't really talk a lot about, there wasn't a lot about si what Simon first thought about Isabel when he saw her and vice versa. So I was really disappointed about not getting a lot of that in the first book. So I kind of felt like as we got towards the end of the stories, everything was going to feel forced. Like they were kind of going to rush them together in the book. But, you know, although things did happen pretty quickly, I thought they did a beautiful job of really describing the relationship between Simon and Isabel. And, you know, obviously Team Malik over here all day. But I'm a huge fan of the relationship between Simon and Isabel because... I think she plays a huge part in why Simon now accepts himself being a vampire and he's okay with that because she loves him for who he is and she truly accepts him. And Simon, he's able to bring out the normal girl in Isabel. He's able to bring out the side of her that no one has before. And I love that. I love the relationship that they have. And I'm so excited to see how it develops in future books. So I want to talk about Sizzy's relationship really quick because I just thought it was beautiful in this book. So I do want to go back to Simon really quickly because we obviously have to talk about that scene where he makes a huge sacrifice for, you know, everybody to, in order to escape Edom. I'm just going to go back really quickly. So pretty much in order for Simon, in order for everyone to escape Edom, Osmodeus, Magnus's father, he pretty much tells Magnus that in exchange for his immortality to rebuild Edom from the disastrous place that Sebastian turned it into, he would allow everybody to escape Edom and go back to New York. But obviously in doing that, with Magnus being well over 400 years old, it would obviously kill him. So Simon decides to offer up his immortality as well because since he's only been a vampire for a short time, he would just revert back to his um, normal teenage self. But in order for that to happen, um, Osmodeus would also have to t wipe away Simon's memory of the Shadow World because without his vampirism, Simon would be a mundane and mundanes can't know about the shadow world so he osmodeus pretty much explains that not only will simon's memories of the shadow world be erased but his memories of clary will as well which i guess makes sense because the only reason he knows about the shadow world or is part of it is because of clary being his best friend so that does make sense but obviously you know it's a very painful scene to witness when clary pretty much begs him not to do that but Simon, you know, he was really the hero in that moment. He saved the day for everyone. He did it anyway. And, you know, he do he loses his memories of the Shadow World and of Clary. And obviously of Isabel, which was devastating for her. You know, I, I kind of wish we would have gotten a little bit better glimpse of, you know, what it meant for Isabel to fall in love with this incredible person only to have it ripped away from her. I think it... In my opinion, I feel like it might have been brought back her memories of, like, grieving Max and make that process even more difficult. But I thought it was really beautiful that we got to witness how Isabel was handling everything. And it's just, it's just an overall reminder of the relationship that Simon has with all of these characters and the important role that he plays in this story as well because I have been reading online and I hear a lot of people say that Simon just fit into the background in these books which I'm completely against I don't agree with at all I feel like Simon was a huge part of these stories especially towards the end because he ended up playing the hero for everyone and that was a really like um brave decision for him to make even though Cleary didn't agree with it and Isabel didn't agree with it, he made that choice in order to save Magnus and to save everyone from Edom. And at the end of the day, you have to respect that. So, take that, haters. 
So obviously, you know, even though I haven't read the books before, I did watch the TV show. And, you know, you get a lot of information about what happens in the stories. So I wasn't surprised at all that... You know, obviously, I haven't read this my first time reading the books, but because of the TV show, I do I did end up getting a lot of information about stuff that happened in the book. So I wasn't surprised at all about, you know, Simon eventually becoming a shadow hunter and ascending back into the shadow world. But, you know, obviously the scenes in which that happened was very new to me. And, you know, Magnus, he gives Simon a choice to become a part of the Shadow World again because, like, his memories were wiped away, but obviously there's these little tidbits of, like, him, you know, his feelings and his memories surfacing because I believe that you can wipe away someone's memories and you can wipe away their, the way that they remember something, but you can't wipe away the way someone felt about something. And so, you know, Simon, he, he named his band the Mortal Instruments you know, when they go back to ch check on him. He named his band the Mortal Instruments, and that's a little bit of a tidbit into why, you know, how he doesn't forget everything completely because I don't think it's possible. I feel like when you go through something and it impacts you so gratefully and it changes who you are, you know, you can't go back to the person that you were before completely. And so I feel like Simon, although he's a mundane, I feel like he was just like, you know, I feel different. Like, I feel like I went through something extremely life-changing, but I can't remember that what it was. It's kind of like, you know, the tip of the tongue syndrome. It's kind of like, you know, when you're thinking of a word and it's right on the edge of your mouth, but you can't exactly say it. I feel like that would be um kind of how Simon remembers everything that's happened. You know, with his memories being taken away, he doesn't he doesn't remember who everyone is, but he does remember those feelings and what it felt like to be a part of the shadow world. And so that's why when Magnus, you know, offers him a chance to become a part of that again, Simon, of course, accepts it. Which we don't actually get to see, you know, when Magnus goes to visit Simon and offers him that choice. It does cut immediately back to Jocelyn and Luke's wedding, which I was extremely pissed about. I would love to see more of, you know, Simon's acceptance and what, like, after Magnus does the spell to bring his memories back, I would have loved to see the reaction that he had when he, like, started getting his memories back. But we didn't get to see that. Instead, we got to witness Jocelyn and Luke's stupid wedding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sure it was a very beautiful ceremony, but I'm saying, like, for me, I would have loved to Witness the moment of recognition on Simon's face once he remembers Magnus and Isabel. I would have loved to see the moments when he remembers Isabel, but we didn't get to, unfortunately. But we did get to see that beautiful dance in which, you know, he, you know, they sort of get back together and everything, which was obviously beautiful. Another moment in which I completely boohooed like a baby. But, yeah, so overall, like, the entire process of Simon becoming a shadow hunter, I feel like... It was kind of meant to be, you know, with him being a vampire, you know, he does, he did in turn come to accept that, but that's not how it was meant to be for him. And with him being a part of the Shadow World as a Shadow Hunter now, like, to me, it just makes so much sense. And I can't wait to read in future books about his training and becoming an official Shadow Hunter. So looking forward to that. And overall, Simon's journey in these books was incredible and can't wait for the next part. Okay, so can I just take a moment to say that I was not expecting to love Jason Cleary's relationship in these books as much as I did. I don't know, it was just really incredible to witness the love story between these two. And obviously with Jace going through, you know, everything he's been going through from the beginning of the story, like... Him finding out that he was Valentine's son and then throughout this, these books it's just been a constant battle of him trying to figure out whether or not he's good or evil and who he was truly raised to be. And obviously Clary becoming a part of the shadow world and her having these gifts and being able to do all these incredible things. I think it's so great how their stories and their journeys have been completely different. They've been going through completely separate issues but they brought them together in such a beautiful way. For me it was Oh my goodness. I love how in this book, Clary's the one to save Jace numerous times, actually. 
you know, obviously after the attack at the Citadel, Cleary drawing the healing room to bring Jace back and protecting him from the heavenly fire by infusing it with the Morgenstern sword. You know, Cleary's pretty much been playing Jace's hero throughout this entire book, which was beautiful for me because getting to witness, you know, Cleary, I feel like in this book, Cleary, she, she is a shadow hunter. Like, she's truly become a shadow hunter. And so, that's part, I think, like, she's used those skills and her own personal gift that she can do that no one else can. I love the fact that we got to see her use those gifts to save Jace and help him through everything. But overall, the love that Cleary and Jace have for each other, it's so evident it's in, in this book particularly. And, you know, obviously, you know, they finally take their relationship to the next level, which I'm not going to talk about because I can't talk about sex. It'll be extremely awkward for me and for you watching you click off of this video so fast. It's not even funny. But, like, the sentimental, the sentimentality of, you know, that scene by the underground pool in Edom, you know, I like the fact that it's their last night before... They could die, you know, it was their last night before they put everything on the line and choosing to take that opportunity to be together and express their love for one another. I think it was so beautifully written. And while I don't condone teenagers having sex, I'm one of those. I just thought it was a beautiful way to show us the love that they truly have for one another. And, you know, really looking forward to seeing, you know, how things develop in the future and the relationship that, Clary and Jace will continue to have in future stories because I'm so looking forward to seeing how that relationship develops. And yeah, so I love Clary and I love Jace and I love the relationship they have together and I'm so excited for their future. I'm gonna cry. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and talk about Malik, and we all already know that I can't do this without getting a little bit dramatic, so brace yourselves. <coughs> so the same way they've been going up and down about the relationship this entire story, I have to. And I'm pretty sure a majority of the readers have as well, but I'm so grateful that they finally came to a resolution in this book and everything finally came to a head. You know, they started out a little bit rocky um, when Magnus came to say goodbye to Alec on his trip to Alicante. Um, it was, uh, there was a bit of a, there, there was a lot of tension there. You know, Alec pretty much explained to him, like, I can't be with someone who's not willing to tell me about their past and who they are, which I for one totally understand, like, I get, like, wanting to share experiences with someone, so I do get that. I understand where he's coming from. But at the same time, you have Magnus, who's, you know, I think it's mostly just him being afraid of his feelings. You know, he's never been with the Shadow Hunter before, and it scares him to have feelings like this for someone. He's kind of, um, he doesn't like being in a state of unknown because the way he feels for Alec. You know, those feelings are stronger than anything he's ever felt before. And I think it makes that, I think it makes it that much harder for him to accept the fact that, you know, he's immortal and Alec isn't. Because, obviously, you know, with him being immortal, one day he's going to, you know, Alec is going to die. And he's trying, I think he's so closed off because he's trying to protect himself from having to go through that and having to deal with that loss and pain. With him being 400 years old, he's obviously experienced loss before, but I think it's different when you're in love with someone and you've ex you're experiencing a love that you've never felt before. So I understand how they got to this point of, you know, stand still in their relationship and not really knowing what to feel or how to handle everything. So there's kind of this moment of back and forth, but I feel like it kind of, you know, with everything they're going through in this book, it does help. Alec and Magnus to realize how much they love each other and how much they want to fight for this. Um, I think, you know, the determination that Alec had to get Magnus back after he was kidnapped by Sebastian speaks more than words. I think it speaks great values about how he, how much he just really loves him and how much he cares about him. And, you know, with Magnus being his first boyfriend, obviously there's, there's this, you know, for the, as readers, for me at least, you know, I feel like there's this moment of like, 
well, is it just puppy love? Like, how does he really know he's the one for him? How does he know that what he's experiencing is what real love is supposed to feel like? Because he's never felt that before. But once he, you know, realizes that he, not knowing if Magnus is alive or dead and not being able to contact him, I think that does start to help him realize just how truly phenomenal their love for each other is. And also, you know, the dream sequence, you know, that... That was a really complicated for me. I, you know, I kind of feel like those dreams were given to um, each of them as a way of, you know, it, those dreams were based off of what they thought they wanted for their lives and, you know, how they envisioned themselves being. And ultimately, you know, they woke back up because they realized that wasn't what they really wanted. But with Alex's dream, the only thing that he truly truly was happy about in that dream is that Magnus was there by his side and his parents were happy for them and they were happy about their relationship and I think that speaks volumes because that allows Alec to know that what he has for Magnus you know the love he has for him is real and they do have what it takes to go the distance and I feel like there's just a bunch of beautiful moments in this story between them. Like, when Magnus is ready to sacrifice himself and die to save everyone. The, you know, I love how it was incredibly described the moment of just heartbreak and tension between Alec and Magnus. And Alec begging him not to do this. And we'll find another way and we'll figure a way out of this. Just loving someone so much that you absolutely refuse to lose them. Like, that scene had me in tears. This whole book had me in tears. This is not a good idea to read this book if you're already an emotionally unstable person. But that, you know, it was, there was just so many beautiful moments between them. And I really, I like how they ended it with, you know, Magnus. He wrote, he wrote down some incredible life stories and he gave the book to Alec to read for himself. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure those short stories that he gave him, I think that's like the Bane Chronicles. I think that's what that book is based off of. So, obviously, definitely going to be reading that now. No questions asked. But I like how they finally came to a compromise about Magnus being willing to share his history with Alec. Because he realizes that that's the only way they're going to make this work. And they both really want to make it work. And, you know, everything they've gone through up to this point, it shows that. And it shows you know, the sacrifices that they're willing to make for each other and how they're willing to fight for their love and make it through anything. And I just, oh my goodness. Like, I am so excited for Magnus and Alex's relationship to, to develop. Obviously, there's some great things coming for them because I haven't, you know, I have heard things about children. But I'm really excited to read about that in future books and to hear more about how their relationship develops. I'm so excited. You guys, I love, I just love the relationship between Magnus and Alec. And I'm so excited for their future. <laughs> Obviously, we have to talk about that really beautiful yet heartbreaking scene towards the end of the book. After Clary kills Sebastian, you know, Jonathan comes back. Jonathan that doesn't have the demon blood. The Jonathan that was the son that Jocelyn really wanted and the brother that Clary really wanted. It was such a beautiful moment. Like, throughout reading this entire book, I was on the verge of tears. And when I started reading that, the tears came out. Like, the floodgates were open and I was just bawling for 10 minutes in my bed with ice cream. I just, what I love about this scene, you know, was Jocelyn. Not so much, not even just Clary, but Jocelyn finally getting the closure that she needs about... Sebastian and you know finally getting her son back even though he did end up dying I just thought it was a really beautiful moment and I'm so glad that you know Jocelyn she finally found peace and Clary she got to have this wonderful moment with her brother who wasn't evil and trying to do all these things it was just really peaceful and beautiful and overall it's just one of the, like it made me hate Valentine that much more but it was an incredible scene and I was really hoping for something like that I was hoping for some moment of Jocelyn you know you know I was really hoping that we would get a moment where you know Jonathan he came back as his normal self and he got to have these beautiful moments with Jocelyn and Cleary because that's what Cleary saw in her dream she saw her brother just as a normal person and I think that's been part of her journey throughout this book as well just like 
you know, she mourned for the brother that she she only knew about for a short period of time, but she mourns the relationship they ne that they never got to have because of situations that were beyond their control. And so I think it was beautiful that she finally got to have that moment with her brother and Jocelyn with her son. Like, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this because I seriously might cry. This scene was so that scene was so beautiful, but I like I just. I love reading about that, and I love the peace behind it, and not just Clary and Jocelyn finally finding peace, but Jonathan as well. Like, I can only imagine how tortured um, his human half must have been after, you know, the demon blood obviously taking over, but there was a bit of humanity in him, I believe, and I, you know, just him finally finding peace and having that side of him destroyed and being able to, you know, with him dying, it does make... It, to me, it makes up for him, you know, ultimately having to die because he died as himself and he died normal. And, you know, Clary and Jocelyn and Jonathan, they had this moment of just being a family. And, oh my goodness, I can't talk about this anymore, you guys. Overall, best scene ever throughout the entire six books. That was definitely my favorite scene. I love the closure that came because of that. And I'm so 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 excited and happy that clary she made peace with that part of herself and she finally got to have her brother and i think it's going to play a huge part in her character development as we see how her life moves on in other books because although those books won't really be revolving around her you know we will get to see glimpses of her life as a shadow hunter and i'm really excited to see who she will become now that she doesn't have an evil demon brother. And she, you know, she can mourn the loss of her brother that she barely knew but still loved. So I'm really excited to see that. But yeah, you guys, overall, I love this book. I love how the author just wrapped things up for everyone. And I'm so looking forward to, you know, reading future books as well. But we're going to talk about that in a minute. Overall, really great books. The entire book series was just incredible, you know. I feel like in the, like the last two book reviews, I've you know, been complaining about how I've been reading so much. Like it's been that difficult, but it really hasn't been difficult. It's not difficult at all to re when you're reading something that you really enjoy. And I genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, have loved reading these books and just being engrossed in this world like i love sci-fi fantasy i love being a part of that world the make-believe and i feel like you know the mortal instruments was my favorite book that i've read so far that's about that world so i no words the entire book series a plus love that so that's it for this book review guys i'm done reading the mortal instruments However, I do plan on reviewing another book series, and that's where you guys come in, because I have no idea what I'm going to be reading next. I, I was going back and forth about whether or not I wanted to go ahead and start reading another um, Shadowhunter Chronicle story, if I wanted to start reading another book series from this world. And after reading, you know, Heavenly Fire, Getting glimpses of all these characters that will be a part of future books is really incredible to me. And it does make that decision that much more difficult because now I'm almost positive that I'm going to be reading um the Lady Midnight series next. I'm not really 100% sure if I'm going to be reading a Shadowhunter Chronicles book story. But if I do end up reading another story from this world, it'll definitely be the Lady Midnight series next. But um, if you guys have any other book recommendations that you want me to read next, please be sure to go ahead and leave those down in the comments below because, you know, like I said, I'm not 100% sure on what the next book series will be. And I would love to get you guys' opinion. I really want your help because there is a bunch of books out there that I really want to read now that I'm back into reading and I don't. Like I said, I don't know what to read next, so please be sure to comment down below and let me know what books you think I should read next. Or if you think I should read another book from the Shadowhunter Chronicles and not go into Lady Midnight. Do you think I should read the Bane Chronicles next? 
or do you think I should move into another book series? Just let me know in the comments below. Please be sure to leave book recommendations and let me know what you thought about this book review. Let me know what you thought of Moral Instruments. Um, I am going to be posting another video next Wednesday. Obviously, it's not um, a book review because there's no more books in the Moral Instruments. I'm not going to really go into great details about what it's about right now because I want to leave that as a surprise. But basically, I'm just going to be um, talking a lot about the books overall and doing comparisons and contrasting between the book and the tv show so that's what that video will be about but yeah that's it for this video guys thank you so much for watching this video please be sure to like comment and subscribe and if you push the notification bell you'll be notified every time i post a video thank you so much for all your love and support it means the world to me and i will see you in the next one bye Also, I did promise myself that I was going to start plugging social media in my videos, which I completely forgot to do. I, I like to try to put it in the videos, like let it naturally come out, but that didn't work out. So if you want to follow me on social media, um, this is my Instagram handle, so you can just type that into the Instagram search bar. I don't know how to post links on YouTube because I'm an idiot. So that's my Instagram handle, and this right here is my Twitter handle, so you can type that into Twitter if you want to follow me there. So please be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter because I would really love to like, uh, you know, just have like a community where we guys can talk to each other and I can respond to your messages and stuff. And in case there's other stuff that you guys want to talk about that I don't post in these videos, let me know the videos that you do want me to make. Because other than these book reviews, I do post other regular videos on this YouTube channel. I haven't in like two weeks, but that's neither here nor there. I do post regular videos on this channel, so please be sure to... Head on over to my social media and let me know what videos you think I should be posting other than book reviews. And if you don't post book recommendations here in the comment section, you can let me know on Instagram as well. Because I do read the DMs and I do read messages on Twitter. So please feel free to go over there and let me know what books you guys think I should be reading as well. But anyway, I really am done with this video now. I have to go. I have stuff to do. But thank you so much for watching the video. Love you. Peace.